ideals of science and enlightenment more generally. Some of them are our cognitive limitations that, that uh, Brian alluded to. It's very hard to wrap your mind around a, a black hole or relativity or some of the findings from uh, quantum physics. Some of them are because there are attitudes of mind that are uh, hard to to uh, shake ourselves out of when it comes to familiar phenomena. It's hard to look at other people and not imagine that they're animated by a, a soul. Mm -hmm. It's hard to look at uh, complex life and imagine that it could have arisen without a designer. But I think some of the impediments come more from our social emotions than our cognitive limitations. Namely, the idea that you should believe in something because it's true does not come naturally to people. Uh, <laughs> in, in most times and places, the assertion of beliefs has been a sign of uh, solidarity with one's culture. You say you believe things to show that you're a, a loyal member of a coalition. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of exerting uh, authority. It's a matter of uh, politeness and convention. And the kind of social norms that function within science, within democracies, within well-run intellectual forums like, uh, like universities that say, you, sh you must have a reason for your beliefs. You may be called upon to uh, provide them. You may legitimately be challenged without it being a form of disloyalty or insult. That a, uh, a graduate student can challenge a Nobel Prize winner if she sees a flaw in his argument and it's not a sign of disrespect to him as a person or to the community. That the all uh, discourse and all belief are subordinated to what's true is a very unnatural uh, social norm. And that, I think, is what science, but more generally, I think of as enlightenment, uh, secular humanism, well-functioning democracy, those are the values that animate all of those enterprises of which science is a particularly successful part. Now, uh, but yeah, but you know, I'm not sure that, that that's true, but except I think for the public, what, how we know it's true or not is a, very, is a very different thing. Whether their willingness to accept that science can distinguish, certainly or at least what's false, which is more important, uh, it, I, I think that's just not generally accepted. I, I obviously I agree with, with Brian and Richard that the, the, the last 350 years have been remarkable. But at the same time, if you, if you look at, at people on the street, if you ask people why a book will fall faster than the piece of paper, most people will say the book is heavier in spite of the fact that we've known for, for hundreds of years that that's not the case. If you ask most Americans at least whether they quote unquote believe in evolution, most of them will say they haven't. So there, there is this disconnect between this remarkable, remarkable enterprise that has literally changed the world and people's perceptions of it. So I think the biggest challenge for us is not just to convince them of the, of the remarkable developments. I mean, for most people, I think for, when they think of science, they think of technology, that science has produced better things that make their lives better. But the ideas and process is something we've done a very poor job, I think, of explaining to people about. And I think until, I think that's the big disconnect, that people need to understand how we make progress in science. And, and, and that's a real challenge. Well, one thing that comes immediately out of what you've just been saying is that science education, especially for the young, the grade school level, has got to be thought about really carefully because uh, it's a very familiar thing that a lot of kids get put off science, find it too difficult, they find the maths too difficult. There have got to be ways of, of presenting this material to, to people that really attract them and bring them in and get more people involved. It's not just a matter of producing more scientists, it's a matter of producing greater scientific literacy. Because the crucial thing at the moment is, you say uh, that people are aware of the fact that uh, technology brings benefits, it also brings serious disbenefits in the form of weapons and you know, accidents that might happen and so on. And that makes people nervous that's one of the reasons why some people can be hostile to science, too. And hostility is always a function of ignorance, largely. I mean, well-informed hostility is something to worry about, but generally speaking, it's, it's ignorance. And so this business about uh, improving scientific literacy in the community is absolutely key. And we know this. There are a heck of a lot of people out there who don't know anything about science. And we've got two problems. One is the people who don't know that they don't know anything. And, and who need to be educated. And worse still, the people who don't know anything, they know they don't know anything and they don't care. And so that's, that's another problem too. <laughs> one, in one or another way, and there are lots of enterprises now. You know, Richard has been uh, a professor of public understanding of science. Brian runs this brilliant thing in New York every summer which educates people, finds ways of getting the message across there uh, in unconventional, exciting, entertaining sort of ways. 
That is where the focus has to be now. It's absolutely crucial to our time with this increasingly rapid explosion of, of insight, of, of mastery of aspects of nature, that more and more people should be good participants in the conversation about what science is, what it's for, what effects it can have on us. And, and that comes down to this project of uh, you know, a lifelong process of educating people to be more literate and to understand something of what's going on. Yeah, I have to say, I can't, I can't say I agree with you. I, I mean, I agree with absolutely everything you say there because um, I've encountered so many kids who, when I begin to tell them some of the interesting things or the things that I think are interesting about science, things about cosmology or astrophysics or, or particle theory, to see their eyes widen and have them say, that's science? Because that's not what they've experienced mm -hmm. science to be. Because so often in the classroom, we quickly focus in on the details, trying to get kids to solve equations and balance reactions and so forth. And the reason for that is clear. The details are important. They're also very easy to examine, right? So you can have tests that are really based on the details, getting the right answer. And if we don't have a commensurate focus on the big, wonderful ideas of science that get kids excited about it, they just don't care enough about the details to really want to engage with them. Yeah, there's, there's a, the, you all know Natalie Angier's wonderful book, The Canon, in yes, which she yes. has an interview with Peter Gallison, the historian of science at Harvard. And, and, and Peter says there's this incredibly difficult task. You take these bright, energetic, energy, uh, you know, information-sucking objects. And beat science out of them or something, right. And <laughs> you, you, you manage to push this rock to the hill, top of the hill there of, of making them completely disinterested. Right. Actually, and, like and, and Natalie says that she, uh, then what happens is that about the age of 12, people go and buy their kids uh, a membership card to the Museum of Contemporary Art and they leave the science behind, which is why the World Science Festival and all the things that you guys are involved in is sound like it's... But it's not just the kids, is it? There has yeah. to be this entire spectrum yeah. being... And I'm going to throw in a plug... One of the reasons... Uh, I'm going to throw in a plug for while we're here. One of the reasons we, we, we've picked Origins to focus on <laughs> is specifically because we've found that, that Origins is, is an area where, which ex both ex excites interest and controversy. And, and gets motiv you want to motivate people to get over the threshold to at least listen. And, yeah. and you want to bring together enough people that get people excited. And I have to say that one of the most exciting events that's happened in this meeting was when we, ha we were in an inner city school in, in, in Phoenix. We had a thousand high school kids for two hours and it was like a basketball event with three <laughs> of the Nobel laureates here. And the kids, I, I just, I wouldn't have believed it. They didn't have to be there. They literally mm -hmm. were not being forced to be there, and they were thrilled to be there. And so there is, there is that inner interest and excitement, and, uh, and uh, we just have to think of ways to motivate not only just the kids, but the people who teach the kids, and the people who also write about science, and the people who also show it on TV, that actually people are fascinated by this if you give them a chance. Yeah. I think there are two problems with, with, with educating people about science. One is that there's the presumption that you should sell science on being useful. Now, science is useful, but the important thing is it's not all it is. And usefulness is not the most exciting thing. A lot of people think it is. They, they sell the space program on the fact that non-stick frying pans are a spin -off. <laughs> I mean, that is so demeaning to something mm. as, as noble as mm. the space program. An, an analogy which I like is that you can appreciate music without actually being able to, do, to play, play an instrument. And a lot of people have a love of music drummed out of them by five-finger exercises on, on the piano right. when they could be listening to Mozart. And um, it, the, the, say, the equivalent to listening to Mozart is your thing about having the Nobel Prize winners coming and telling about the wonders of the universe. And similarly, in school, you don't have to teach science by getting out a Bunsen burner and, and getting people to do melt things in crucibles and things. You can teach how wonderful it is, how, how elegant it is. That's because we want also, as, as, as educators, we tend to want to create clones of ourselves, I think, and Brian brought up, well, we tend to think it's really important that these students have all the skills that we have, but they, most of them don't need them. They're not going to be physicists or biologists. What they need is, is an understanding of the process and the wonder. And I think we were getting Steve, um, I, I agree with everything, except that I think we're, we'd be deluding ourselves to think that the only reason that there's hostility to science is because there's ignorance of yeah. science. And in fact, there are studies of people who endorse evolution because they come from blue states and they like Barack Obama and they know that endorsing evolution is the correct thing to do, who actually have a rather faulty understanding of it. And I would not be surprised if the converse was true, that some of the people who are hostile to evolution probably understand at least uh, the, the core of what makes it work. 
people also have attached moral and uh, cultural significance to certain beliefs. And the people who are hostile to evolution are ones who think that it is incompatible with moral values. That if evolution were completely mm -hmm. true, we would be like, uh, if you teach kids their animals, they'll behave like animals, we'd be raping, we'd be uh, carrying out the dictates of our selfish genes, value, purpose, meaning would evaporate. So part of the story of science and what makes it so ennobling is that that is the, couldn't be farther from, from the uh, truth, that there is nothing uh, belittling, there is nothing uh, about science that takes away meaning and purpose and morality, uh, and that, the, that we have been, I think, doing a poor job in letting the uh, traditional religious and cultural right uh, have the franchise on meaning and morality. There has to be a way, a way of saying that the values that make science possible, such as self-examination, such as a respect for the truth, such as humility and awe and wonder uh, uh, in the face of the natural world are all ennobling. And moreover, they lead to a, a sounder morality and ethics than ones based on uh, dogma or cultural inertia. Yes, I think it's a very, very important point, and I, I agree very much just even there. A lot of people uh, think that uh, science is reductive in the sense that they that you you don't see the pearl, you only see the disease of the oyster, and somehow or this takes all the colour out of the world and all the meaning. And and what what you can easily uh, do is to tell people that what the 18th century Enlightenment was about was about the attempt to apply canons of rationality and, and evidence-based reasoning and, and uh, uh, you know, empirical constraints to 